The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in the epistle of Jude, beginning at verse 4. Now certain people have crept in, unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not, uh, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet... In like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams to file the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they like unreasoning animals understand only instinctively. Woe to them. They walked in the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy without fear, hating Even the garments stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This is... Is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as you may have surmised, we've got a lot to try and cover this morning. Now, this is a remarkable, remarkable little letter. And there's no possible way that we can do full justice to it in the short time that we have. But my prayer is that this will awaken in you a desire to learn and study more of this rich, rich part of God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would open our eyes 
to all of the wonders, all of the promises, all of the treasures, and all of the stern warnings of your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A wolf in sheep's clothing is an idiomatic phrase taken from uh, Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets, Jesus said, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The phrase memorably describes those playing a role contrary to their real character, with whom contact is very dangerous. It's a portrayal of false teachers in the church. Jesus says that their true nature will be revealed by their actions, by their fruits, he says. You shall know them. Throughout the ages, the idea, the picture of the wolf in sheep's clothing has been a warning to God's people. Uh, Under a sheep's skin often hides a wolfish mind was a a common proverb throughout the early church and into the medieval age. And the picture that it portrays uh, was uh, was played out in a host of morality plays and uh, folk stories and fairy tales across the centuries. Our most familiar version is the wolf in grandmother's clothing. The fables of the brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. She lived in a village near the forest. and She always wore a velvet riding cloak of scarlet. So that everyone in the village called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, she went to visit her grandma, bringing a basket of goodies. But as she went, a very hungry, very big, very bad wolf began to follow her. The story goes on to describe how the big bad wolf went ahead to grandma's house He gobbled her up, dressed in her nightclothes, tucked into her bed, and awaited Little Red Riding Hood. The story ends in near disaster. Grandma and Little Red Riding Hood are rescued just in time by a brave huntsman, a kinsman redeemer. The fairy tale is, in fact, a cautionary tale, but a cautionary tale with a happy ending. In a sense, that's exactly what we have here in Jude's letter. It's a cautionary tale with a happy ending. There are wolves, false teachers. Uh, We uh, saw last time that they... Uh, creep in unnoticed. They're unnoticed because they're wearing sheep's clothing, but they are ungodly. They made light of the grace of God, perverting it into sensuality. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, uh, warned them, saying, you were called to freedom, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for your own flesh. But in love, serve one another. These false teachers were heedless of Paul's warning. As a result, they deny the Master and the Lord Jesus Christ. They are heretics. This is not a matter of quibbles about a few obscure doctrines. They are apostate. And they are dangerous. To illustrate, but Jude uses a whole series of stories and quotes, metaphors and descriptions in a poetic form 
that to capture our attention and to warn us. Our calling is to contend for the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. So Jude stretches his vocabulary. There are actually 18 words that are used here in Jude that are used nowhere else in the Bible. There are 22 words that are used only occasionally elsewhere. In addition, the whole thing is structured around triplets, a whole series of threes. So in verse 4, we see that these false teachers crept in. They were unnoticed, and they're designated for condemnation. Verse 4, they're ungodly. They pervert the truth of God, and they deny the Lord Jesus. Verse 8, they defile, they reject, they blaspheme. Verse 10, they do not understand. They are unreasoning, and they operate by instinct. Uh, Verse 11, they go the way of Cain. They fall into Balaam's error. Uh, They uh, run to Korah's rebellion. Verse 12, they're hidden reefs, selfish shepherds, waterless clouds. Uh, Verse 12, they're fruitless trees. Verse 13, and wild waves and wandering stars. Verse 15, I love this. They are ungodly. They are ungodly. They are ungodly. Verse 16, they're grumblers, they're malcontents, they're boasters. Uh, Verse 19, they cause divisions, they're worldly, they're devoid of the Spirit. In verses 5 through 7, we have three Old Testament stories. The story of the Exodus, from Exodus chapters 12 through 14. The story of the rebellion at Kadesh, from Numbers chapter 14. And the rebellion of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. And then we have three stories from apocalyptic literature uh, that is uh, not actually in the Bible. Uh, They are instead in the Apocrypha. In verse 6, the story of the fall of the angels. In verse 9, the contention over the body of Moses. And in verses 14 and 15, a quotation from the apocryphal book of Enoch. In verse 11, we have three Old Testament characters. Cain, uh, Genesis 4. Balaam, Numbers 22. Korah from Numbers chapter 16. The whole point that Jude is making here is that uh, all of the evil that we've seen in the past and all of the disaster that it wrought and the judgment that was rained down upon it is ever present in this poor fallen world. This is a sobering assessment. And to this... But Jude adds two sets of three metaphors. In verse 12, the first set, uh, they are, these false teachers, are hidden reefs. They're selfish shepherds. Uh, They are waterless clouds. And then in verses 12 and 13, the second set of metaphors, they're fruitless trees, wild waves, and wandering stars. All of these are biblical images invoked to remind us of the stories that they come from in the Old Testament. Psalm 1, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 25, Isaiah 14, Isaiah 57. Essentially, uh, what Jude is saying is that these false teachers, they are all cattle and no hat. They're all icing and no cake. They're all sizzle and no steak. They're all show and no go. They're all talk and no walk. They're all smoke and no barbecue. (laughs) They're pretentious. They're narcissistic. They're abusive. Everything that they do is about them. They build their own monuments to themselves. They are pretenders. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they are dangerous. In verse 8, we're told that they defile the flesh. They reject authority. They blaspheme the holy things. 
Verse 16 says that they are grumblers and malcontents and boasters. Verses 18 and 19 says that they are scoffers and they are worldly. They are devoid of the Spirit. All of this is intended to be a cautionary tale. We're not to take them lightly. We're not to ignore them. We are to contend for the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. Jude was living in dangerous times. Times of compromise. Accommodation to the world. Shallowness. Entertainment posing as spirituality. Sound familiar? So in a context like that, a sobering context, where the very grace of God is trivialized, and thus the sacrifice of Jesus is made an excuse for our own licentiousness and sensuality, how should we then live? Well, this is really the heart and soul of the passage. All of this, all of this poetry leading up to the uh, point of Jude's application is intended to sober our hearts, to settle our minds, and to set us aright. Verses 20 and 21 say, the first thing that we need to do in times of distress and apostasy and accommodation is to tend to ourselves by running to the means of grace. He says three things. First, Build yourselves up in the faith. Second, pray in the Holy Spirit. Third, keep in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus. So how do you build yourselves up in faith? I mean, our tendency is always to run to works righteousness. In a sense, we're, we're all proto-Pharisees. Now, every single one of us has the inclination to be the very wolves that Jude is warning against. So, how do you build yourselves up in the faith? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2, in the same way you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. How did you receive Christ? Well, you receive Christ by grace, through faith. This not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast, right? How do you build yourself up in faith? You lay hold of the means of grace. The ordinary means of grace. He says, pray in the Holy Spirit. How do you pray in the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us in John chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians chapter 6, Romans chapter 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we cry out for mercy. We lift up the name of the Almighty. We praise Him for His mighty works. That's praying in the Holy Spirit. Third, he says, keep in the love of God. Awaiting the mercy of the Lord Jesus. How do we keep in the love of God? Well, first John chapter four, we're told explicitly, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you see what Jude is saying here? In times of trouble, you know what you need? You need grace, and you need grace, and you need grace. You need the gospel. You need to lay hold of the means of grace. What are you doing fiddling around with everything else in your life? Run to his mercy. Lay hold of his grace. Put yourself 
in the way of grace. But, what if the wolves, how are we to contend for the faith? Are we to hate them? Are we to fear them? Are we to shun them? Are we to shame them? Are we to expose them? This is what he says in verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on doubters. Snatch others from the fire. And still others. Show mercy with fear. Hating even the garments, even the garb that is stained with their perversions, with their sin, with their wickedness. Here what Jude does is he takes the the standard of Proverbs, uh, which says that all human beings can be divided into essentially three categories. There are ordinary sinners... For ordinary sinners, doubters, were to have mercy on them. But besides ordinary sinners, there are fools. Those we are to snatch from the fire. A fool is someone heedless of the fire, walks right into the fire. And our job is to snatch them out of the fire. Still others are wicked. We're to show mercy, but with fear, hating even the garb stained with sin. Ordinary sinners, fools, and the wicked. I don't know if you noticed it, but earlier we read a passage from Isaiah where it says that even if we are fools... He will steer us onto the right way. Ordinary sinners and fools like us, they are the ones that where the mercy of God, the grace of God, the rescue of God is to be applied. The wicked were to show mercy, but mercy with fear. So, this um, cautionary tale does have a happy ending. You know, when the Little Red Riding Hood faces the wolf, then she walks in and she says, Grandma, what big eyes you have. Grandma, what sharp teeth you have. The wolf greets her warmly at first and then gobbles her up. And it looks like absolute certain disaster. Grandma and Little Red Riding Hood are both gone. But then a rescuer comes. The huntsman. He confronts the wolf. He slices the wolf open. It's really gruesome. This stuff can't be published today. <laughs> and Grandma and Little Red Riding Hood are pulled out whole, alive and happy. You realize that's our story? We have been swallowed by the wolf. But because of his grace... He rescues ordinary sinners and fools like us. And so in verses 24 and 25, Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, grace, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, grace, With great joy, grace, B 
be glory and majesty and dominion and authority. Past, present, and future. Before all time, now, and forever. Now, this anthem of praise issues forth. The dangers are real. The wolves are prowling. They, they will destroy everything. But there is a kinsman redeemer who has come for his own. And so Jude says, run to his mercy. Lay hold of his grace. Embrace the rescue of the kinsman redeemer. Thus says the Lord, in repentance and rest, you shall be saved. This is the glory of the good news of the gospel in desperate, dangerous times. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.